multiple discovery in science has been has happened very frequently. Uh, scientific disputes happen very, very often. So I've tried to reach an understanding of why that might be. Hi, I'm Dr. Jed McCosco at Wake Forest University and Academic Influence. And today we have a special guest coming to us from UCLA. His name is Professor Eric Sherry, and he studies the history and philosophy of chemistry. So Professor Sherry, thanks for coming to the show today. Uh, thank um, you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, well, we want to know, what are the big contributions that you and also your colleagues in the same field have made that have helped people understand things better? What, what would you say are some of the big contributions? Sure. Well, one of the, uh, the, the sort of raison d'etre for the philosophy of chemistry, the reason why it, it took off <clears throat> was that traditionally philosophers of science have tended to concentrate on physics because it's rightly regarded as the most fundamental science. And when it was realized that they had concentrated perhaps a little too much on physics, they went, philosophers of science, went to the other end of the scientific spectrum in a sense, and the philosophy of biology began to develop. And in doing that, and our philosophy of biology being is important because biology is clearly not explainable, reducible to physics. So there was a need to study living systems, and that philosophy, that branch of philosophy, developed back starting in about the 50s and 60s and, and 70s. Now, in doing that, it's as if they leapfrogged completely over chemistry. So chemistry was left out. Even though chemistry is generally regarded, as I'm sure you know, Jed, as the, the central science. We chemists love to remind people that we are the central science. And so here's the central science that employs more people, by the way, than physicists and biologists put together, as far as I know, and yet it was ignored. Furthermore, and perhaps sort of more relevantly, um, there's a question of reduction in philosophy of science asks whether one field is explainable by a more fundamental field. So the driving question, one of the driving questions in the philosophy of chemistry has been, is chemistry fundamentally nothing but physics? Is it explainable from first principles of physics? The usual response has been, yes, of course it is. You know, it's not that far removed from physics, and physics has had tremendous success in explaining chemistry. For instance, the, the importance of quantum mechanics in making predictions in chemistry Therefore, chemistry can be regarded as being fully reduced. Now, on more careful reflection, of course, it's realized that it's not as simple as that. And so one of the areas that have, has been of interest to people in, in my discipline has been to examine that question more critically, more closely, and to really ask the question, not is it reduced or isn't it reduced? It, it's not a black and white question, more a question of the extent to which it is reduced. How good is quantum mechanics at making predictions in chemistry, for example? But wouldn't that just depend on the strength of the computers that are used to simulate how quantum mechanics can predict? Well, to, to some extent, yes. And of course, one has to you know, be aware of what's going on in computational chemistry. But I mean, the computational uh, methods can take you so far, but there comes a point where the chemist still has to make a judgment call on whether to use one system or another. And, and it's, it's as much interpretation as there is raw computation going on. Okay. So, yeah. so, so you, I mean, obviously there are lots of different approximations of the true quantum mechanical picture yeah. and the chemist is used to choose between those different ways of approximating things. Um, but in the end, if the computer was big enough, couldn't they just do everything sort of ab initio and make it all work from first principles or are you, yes. of the okay. So, yes. you so that brings up the question of in principle or in practice, in principle, if the computer was powerful enough and if we had enough time, then yes, we all assume that physics would be able to explain chemistry and, and biology and, you know, even, even more, even larger systems. But that's, that's such an academic question that, 
in it, yes, I mean, let's say that the answer is yes, it doesn't get us very far. We're more interested in what, what we can do at the moment. We're more interested really in the in practice question rather than the in principle question. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that, that, that makes the question, I guess, more interesting and a little bit easier to answer is like, okay, so when does the chemist have to really put on a chemist hat and look through it through chemistry glasses in order to make the thing work so we can get answers to our questions about right. does this react this way or that way? And, right. uh, and what are those chemistry glasses and how do they differ from just physics classes? So can you tell us a little bit about that? You've spent your whole career thinking about that and I'm sure you have some really interesting insights. Well, the chemist, as you've hinted at, is, is used to or has a tendency to use approximations and is not interested in the, in the clean solving of solving of equations from first principles, for example. And I, I, I believe it's even true of physicists that if you, if you speak to a physicist and you compare the physicist with a the mathematician, they too are more likely to accept approximations. Um, incidentally, another aspect of this, this question and one that I've been particularly interested in is the educational question. Um, does one present chemistry as though it were nothing but physics? In other words, do you begin teaching students orbitals, electron shells, and so on? Or do you begin by teaching chemistry itself and then later in the student's education present them with more fundamental explanations? It does seem more and more as if these days there is a tendency to be, if you like, seduced by the physics explanations and then the thinking that if you teach the students quantum mechanics right from the outset, it will, it will be helpful and they'll be able to explain and understand chemistry. And that's, to my mind and, and some other people, like misses the point because it misrepresents chemistry and makes it look like chemistry is nothing but physics. So and, this and is I just... Think, yeah, I, I think you're right about that. I mean, as, as somebody who's especially taught thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, uh, a lot of times people want to just go after thermodynamics with uh, a physics set of glasses and, and mathematician, probabilistic, statistics way of looking at it. But I feel like you miss a lot of the insights that you can gain by shaping your brain to understand things in a different way, uh, you know, an equally true way, an equally mathematical way of explaining the partial differential equations that go into these thermodynamic properties, uh, but uh, but one that preserves for you those glasses that can become so helpful. Yeah. And if you don't have those, or if you don't, at least don't have some people in the world wearing those chemistry glasses looking at the problems, then you will undoubtedly miss some answers, important answers. Is, right. is that what you're kind of saying? That's... What I'm kind of saying that the, yes, different scientists are working at different levels at, on the on the scale of uh, systems, and obviously the chemist is working at a grosser level uh, than the physicist in many instances, and therefore has to use the tools, the mathematical tools, the approximations that are appropriate to that level. Yeah, very cool. Well, tell us a little bit about the books that are coming out. Uh, you've written a bunch of books, but there's a few new ones. Tell us what, you, what do you have coming out soon? One book that, that just came out is a, a second edition of my, perhaps my main book, which first came out in 2007. The title was, and still is, The Periodic Table, Its Story and Its Significance, which is another way of saying its history and its philosophy. But, um, in order not to put too many people off, because philosophy especially tends to frighten the general public and, and even scientists, who many of whom regard philosophy as something of a waste of time. <laughs> there, are, there are many famous scientists who have, who have said as much. Uh, I, I could name a few. Um, Steven Weinberg, the physicist, physicist, has a long-standing controversy about the usefulness or otherwise of philosophy. Peter Atkins, the famous chemist and, and author, also has made a, a thing of saying that philosophy of science contributes nothing to science. And, and in, interestingly, these people spend a lot of time philosophizing oh, about definitely. science. But, 
Well, we will talk about them later. I want to hear a little bit more about um, the other book that you said is, okay. is coming out. The, the other book that's coming out is, uh, is called uh, What is an Element? Mm-hmm. Now, we all think we know what elements are, but there, again, there's a, there's a long and rich story that, that exists here. Let me just briefly uh, touch on it. Um, when, when somebody points, let's say, at carbon on the periodic table, what do they mean by, by claiming well, to talk about carbon? Do they I mean, mean diamond? Do yeah. they mean graphite? Do they mean C60? No, they mean carbon, the abstract right. element carbon. Similarly, when we say carbon, do we mean carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14? We don't mean any of those individual instances of carbon. We mean carbon, the element. So that has a deep significance in the philosophy of science, that that very question. There are two senses of element. There's element as the abstract concept, which does a lot of work in science, even though scientists, chemists often want to deny that the abstract concept does any work. And then there's the element as what's called the simple substance, this thing that you can put in in a jar or in a bottle and that you can actually experiment on. So that whole dynamic about what those two different meanings are is the subject of this most recent book. It's actually an edit, edited collection. We have different people expressing different views on this. Wow, that sounds fascinating. And when is it due out? It's, it's just come out. Wonderful, that is really exciting. Well, we, uh, we look forward to uh, putting a link on our website so that people can find that fascinating book sure, that and be, uh yeah. and now that you're done with editing that volume what's next do you have other volumes you want to edit or uh, a book you want to write yourself I've, it's it's funny it, maybe this has something to do with the current pandemic but for the first time in 20 years i've actually not actively writing a book and uh, it, it it feels good but of course i'm inevitably planning new ones i'm <laughs> I'm getting together with a molecular biologist uh, at UC Riverside, and we're planning to write a book comparing the, dis- the dis- Darwin's discovery and Mendeleev's discovery. Wow. Because there are many parallels and, and differences. Their main books were, were published 10 years apart. Darwin's Opus Magnus was 1859. Mendeleev's book was 1869. Their discoveries were made in a sort of conceptual way. There was no fundamental explanation for why evolution occurs. There was no fundamental explanation for why the periodic table is what it is. And of course, as history has unfolded, we now have a whole genetics background to evolution. We have the discovery of DNA to explain biology at a fundamental level. And in the case of the periodic table, the discovery of atomic structure, the electron in particular, electronic structure, which provides a fundamental explanation for the periodic table. So we want to trace that development. Fascinating. That is absolutely fascinating. I hope that book comes out soon. I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun to work on. Um, Well, is there anything else that uh, you think is important as people watch videos on famous chemists, famous other scientists, that you as a philosopher of science and a historian of science want to share? Um, Yeah, maybe. And this is the subject of another book, actually. I happen to have a copy here because I was looking something up before. A Tale of Seven Scientists, because I have the view that um, multiple discovery in science has has happened very frequently. Uh, Scientific disputes happen very, very often. So I've tried to reach an understanding of why that might be. And in doing that, I am of the opinion that scientific discoveries are not made by one or two individuals, but they're made by numerous individuals, all working away, all chipping away, and that this contributes to the overall development of science. And I call it an evolutionary account of of science. I disagree with Thomas Kuhn's view that there are revolutions in science, because if there are revolutions, then presumably there are very decisive steps. And this is an idea which has been made famous by Thomas Kuhn, you know, the logic of 
uh, what was the title of the structure of scientific revolutions. For me, it's not a matter of revolutions. It's a matter of evolution. And I see that the importance of the, what I call the little people, minor contributors. For example, uh, when Bohr developed the Bohr model of the, the atom, he drew heavily on the work of John Nicholson, almost completely unknown unless you're a physicist with a special interest in the history of atomic structure. Um, in, in chemistry, there have been numerous cases. When atomic number was discovered, this is usually attributed to Moseley, the British physicist. Well, there was a Dutch economist, as a matter of fact, called Vandenbroek, who really was the first to suggest that the elements should be ordered according to atomic number or to the charge as it, as it corresponds to, the charge of each uh, atom. Almost completely unknown, and yet he did some groundbreaking work. So I'm arguing for the role of the little people, and I'm arguing that science is really a, a collective enterprise, although not consciously collective. Of course, there are teams of scientists more and more that work on things, but I'm talking about the fact that even though these people appear to be working in isolation, they're all contributing to the overall development of science. So if you like, it's my, my own view of the, the philosophy of science. It's, it's that, become uh, less and less fashionable to try and understand the nature of science as a whole. It's, it's usually thought to be too difficult a problem. So I'm, I'm attempting what's regarded in philosophy of science as the, the impossible to describe <laughs> the nature of science. Many people have tried, Popper, Kuhn, Feyerabend, Lakatos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, the field is fragmented into one looks into causation or reduction or emergence or, you know, one of these. And of course, I do that as well, but it was nice to have a crack at the, at the, at the big, the, the big question. big enchilada, as we like yeah, to say. The, the, yeah. the <laughs> um, full so monty. As the full monty, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so how do the seven scientists fit into that amazing thesis that you just laid out? They are seven very little known scientists who, ah. who I believe made key contributions. One of them is Nicholson. Uh, the other one is Vandenbroek that I mentioned. Absolutely fascinating. Well, well, the, the whole thesis sounds really cool. Uh, and of course, Thomas Kuhn has made a huge impact in people's understanding of how things move forward. Yeah. And I hope that this book continues to gain uh, popularity and, uh, you know, shape people's view of how science has moved forward, the conversation of science. So very, very cool. Thank you so much, um, Eric, for coming on this show. It was really fun to have you as our guest. And we appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. Thank you, Jed. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you.